health, psychology, and human nature with André Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome back, friends, to Health, Psychology and Human Nature with me, André Stureson. A science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. Is it possible to affect how long we live and our long-term health? Can you live until you become 100 with the health of a 60-year-old? Luigi Fontana, he has a science-based broad approach to both longevity and long-term health. He also shares his great thoughts about the good life and also how we can affect the state of our planet. I highly encourage you to check out his new book named The Path to Longevity. Luigi Fontana, he is a professor of medicine and nutrition and a Leonard P. Ullman chair in translational metabolic health. He's also the director of the Health Longevity Research and Clinical Program. You'll find him at Twitter at LuigiFontana22, and you can also find his YouTube channel by searching for Luigi Fontana on YouTube. Friends, I really hope you enjoy today's episode. Luigi, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, for coming on. It's... uh, it's a real uh, honor having you on. I, I've been looking at some of the stuff you've done. And it's, it's, uh, it's really fascinating. I also like the approach that you have. You have quite a general approach when it comes to both increasing how long we live and also our health. So I like your perspective on things as well. Yes, you know, it's, um, I think that, you know, we need, you know, to have a more holistic but mechanism based, you know, I think, you know, the problem in, 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 in medicine right now, you know, there is this division between new age where, you know, there is this kind of soft uh, type of medicine, like it's called alternative, alternative medicine that is not very well received by the classical uh, medical uh, doctors. So they don't, they don't trust, you know, these, soft kind of uh, alternative <laughs> medicine and then there is the hard you know drug uh, surgery based type of medicine and uh, what i try to do in all these years is to find a bridge between you know what is a, a more holistic approach to health and longevity uh, and the hardcore medicine. Uh, And we started from dissecting which pathways, which molecular pathways are important in regulating aging and, uh, and therefore the disease of aging. And what many of my (laughs) colleagues, basic scientists found is that aging can be manipulated. And that, and, and, yeah, basically, you know, before, you know, people thought, you know, you know, aging is like a wear and tear process where, you know, if you if you if you keep using the same shirt uh, day after day, eventually it's going to it's going to, you know, wear out, it's going to destroy. But instead of, you know, we discovered there are particular genes and particular pathways that instead of are regulating the accumulation of metabolic and molecular damage. And, in, and therefore, we can in some way accelerate or decelerate the accumulation of damage and we can accelerate or decelerate aging and the disease of aging. And that is a, 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 one of the things, I think one of the most important points that I've learned when it comes to aging is that it seems like 
our lifestyle and how we live our life and other other factors as well really seem to affect how how fast we age and the faster we age the faster we also get all these different chronic diseases as well i think that's perhaps the perhaps one of the most important take-home messages when over that i've learned so far you know that's you are exactly right that's that's you know it, it, it's so simple that people they under they underestimate how important what you just said is uh, because you know what thank you to the biology of aging uh, uh, field we have discovered is that as we as we are uh, getting older there are a number of processes within our cells and tissues that in some way are regulating the accumulation of damage and you can see you know as as you get older you know your skin is changing you know i can touch Without looking, I can touch the skin of a newborn, of a 20 years old person, or of a 50 or 90 years old person, and just by touching the skin, I can, I can say who is a newborn or or a 80 years old person. For so sure. there are changes that are happening in our body, and these are due to uh, a dysfunction of these uh, metabolic molecular pathways that are regulating the accumulation of damage. So as we get older, our cells, our, the systems are becoming less efficient in repairing damage. The beauty is that, you know, what we have discovered, that, you know, there are a number of pathways, and in particular, these nutrient-sensing pathways that are controlling the accumulation of damage. And so we can manipulate them and so the most important that, you know, we have discovered is the insulin IGF-1 and TOR pathway. And now we have plenty of data in, uh, in animal models showing, it, showing that if we downregulate these nutrient sensing pathways by diet or by genetic manipulation, you know, we can knock down or overexpress genes along these nutrient sensing pathways or even with a drug called rapamycin that is an inhibitor of mTOR, we can slow down aging and we can prevent multiple chronic disease at the same time. So the beauty is that, you know, what we have discovered is that, you know, we can, by acting upstream, we can delay the accumulation of molecular damage so that an animal that is, I don't know, 80 years old, the equivalent of a human being that is 80 years old, physiologically is like 40 I think years that, old. I think that's so interesting about what you just said, that, that we have, like our cells and our body have these, um, are, is able to sense how much, basically how much energy, how much, I mean, how much food we take in that is uh, changed to energy and also other things. And and if our body sense that we don't have as much, then it seems like, it, then it seems like we, if we're in that state, that we we live longer. Yes, you know, and from what we are understanding, you know, we are not one hundred percent sure, you know, but there is good evidence is that these um, these um, uh, adaptations have one reason, and the reason is that you know all uh, human creatures, living creatures. Uh, they have one main goal in life that is reproduction so what nature for what is important for nature is to transmit genes from one generation to the other generation otherwise you know if that if this doesn't happen basically there is an extinction of that species okay so because food is not always available in nature it's not like now where you know you can go to the supermarket and you can buy food and in some way, you know, with, the, with this COVID crisis, you know, we started to sense, you know, you, you were going to the supermarket and, it, and, you know, it was empty of some food. You know, for example, here in Australia, where I live in Sydney, for a few weeks, you know, you were going to the supermarket and they said, you know, you can only buy two packets of pasta or something, you know, because they wanted to be sure that everybody had enough food. Yeah. So in nature, that's the normal. So basically, let's say, you know, there is a year where, you know, it's uh, raining too much or it's raining too little. 
and you have a disruption of the of you know of you know when the, there is particular time and you have the flowers you know that are becoming fruits and, uh, and and you basically you have a very bad uh, year uh, then you know food is scarce when if when food is scarce what happens is that you know nature knows that you know is not good you know to to re, to, to reproduce because the chance of these uh, young animals you know offspring you know to survive is 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 much lower so I remember, you know, when I was a medical student, my professor of pathology told us that the first um, function that disappears when you have a tumor in your hypothesis, the hypothesis is this gland in your, at, the, at the bottom of your brain that's very important because it's producing very important hormones like TSH that is controlling thyroid. Uh, FSH and LH, 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 LH that is controlling testosterone, estrogen, so the sexual function. ACTH that is controlling cortisol, and then uh, growth hormone that is controlling IGF-1, and then prolactin. So the first function, as soon as you have a tumor in your in your in this hypothesis is growing, the first function that goes away is the sexual function. So the FSH, LH is the first one that is eliminated. So that's very interesting because, you know, when you go in, in, in color restriction, the first function that, you know, is, is going to be suppressed is, again, reproduction. OK. And the energy that, you know, you, we normally use from reproduction and growth goes into maintenance. So the concept is that if food is not available, I want to maintain my body my genes, my DNA quality as, as better as I can. So when food is available again, I can reproduce and have good offspring. Okay. And that's how it works. And it makes sense. You know, for example, a woman, uh, the risk of a, of, of, of a girl to have basically a Down syndrome kid is one in 1500 approximately. So this, this girl has to have 1500 kids to have one with Down syndrome. But when this woman is gonna be 45 or 50, the risk of having a Down syndrome kid is one in 30 approximately. So you go over from one in 1500 to one in 30. Why? Because during these 30 years, there is an accumulation of DNA damage in the ovocytes, in the DNA of the ovocytes, that is, in, is drastically increasing the risk of uh, having a Down syndrome kid. And that's how exactly how dietary restriction, color restriction works. By diverting energy from reproduction in, and growth into DNA maintenance and autophagy, DNA repair, antioxidant pathways, and, uh, and and other few function, basically we are keeping the our cells, our mitochondria, our DNA younger and healthier. I think that's I think that's very very interesting, especially especially what you said uh, back there about how how our body is able to adapt to having lower amounts of calories, so that it starts to repair itself. Um, when it when it comes to this. Um, when it comes to living longer, I, I think it would be very, very interesting to know, like, in your opinion, like, how, how much can we actually affect how long we live as humans? Well, we don't know. We don't really know. <laughs> what I know, yeah. what, what I know is that, you know, the, 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 uh, the average lifespan went from 45 years in uh, 1850 to 80 for men, 84 for women. And I think there is a lot of space for improvement because right now, uh, most of the people in Western countries, uh, they are eating high calorie, high protein, uh, low fiber, uh, they are not properly exercised, you know, now smoking has reduced, but it's still present. So I will guess that uh, probably lifespan can be pushed 
easily, you know, to 100, 110 at least. And most importantly, health span can be drastically improved, you know, so that, you know, when you are in your 80, you know, you don't have diseases. And we know it works, you know, because uh, 20% of centenarians, they don't develop any disease before 100, 100 years of age. So we know that even in humans, not only in animals, even in humans, you know, je- you know, it's biologically possible to live a long life without de- developing diseases or develop or we develop they develop disease only in the very last uh, few years, uh, two three years of uh, of their life. Instead of right now, what happens is that more and more people, they spend, you know, many years, you know, with multiple medications, they start to become frail, they start to have issues and psychological depression, they are not functional, they have multiple diseases, the more drugs they take, the more side effects they have, and it's becoming a vicious circle. As a doctor, you know, I can really see, you know, you know when you, you start to work with people that they want to change their health, but they start to tell you, look, you know, I cannot do exercise because my joints are gone. So, you know, I I cannot exercise. Okay, so exercise is not anymore something you can prescribe. You know, I cannot do, I cannot eat this one, you know, because if I eat this one, then, you know, I have problem, you know, with uh, my gut or, or, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm doing, I have diabetes, you know, I cannot do fasting or, so then it becomes very, very complicated, you know, to deal with, uh, with people that they are well advanced, you know, with, uh, with uh, their medical conditions. And so you have limited possibility to, to, to work. And that's why now in my, in my clinic here in Sydney, I have the healthy longevity clinic. I prefer to work with people that, you know, they are borderline, you know, for example, some, you know, some people that, you know, they have, you know, they start to have high blood pressure and, uh, and, you know, you have fantastic results, you know, you know, for example, few, 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 few people, they, 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 you know, they had like, you know, 140, 45, 50, 90 uh, millimeter of blood pressure, you know, with a couple of months of a very healthy lifestyle, you know, now they send me data of blood pressure of 115 over 80, over right. 75. We have data, you know, where, you know, people with type 2 diabetes, initial type 2 diabetes, they lose more than 15 kilos, 80%, they are completely free of diabetes. They stop taking medications. There are studies showing that, you know, you take people with fatty liver disease, people that they lose more than 10% body weight, 100% liver fat gone, and and 60% of people with uh, fibrosis, fibrosis is reducing, is declining. So it's amazing, you know, what we can do with, uh, with, uh, with a healthy lifestyle if we know how to use them, because that's the problem. A lot of people out there, they have it. They don't have a, the correct understanding of how different nutritional manipulations, different exercise uh, training patterns, and uh, meditation uh, and uh, breathing techniques can act on physiological, metabolic, and molecular pathways that are important for aging. I think you know. Also, it it would just be interesting to know. I know that this this might be a hard question, but I would like to just take an example and just see what you think. So, let's say that we have these two twins, and and one of the twins, uh, that that this person is, you know, the genes or both. I mean, both have genes. Just they're okay. They're not really good. Not really bad. And one of the person is not doing any intermittent fasting. Is eating a little bit more than. Then the person should is not exercising, drinks perhaps ten units of alcohol on the weekends, you know, sedentary. Um, and and the other person, the other twin, is living optimally, like 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 what what you would pres- prescribe or just what what you think is optimally for living longer and also being healthy as long as you can. How long do you think that? Like, how much do you think that? the person who would live optimally compared to the person who would live kind of normally, uh, but uh, perhaps a little bit 
worse than than the the normal everyday person like how how many years do, do you think that that person would live longer again you know you're asking a very dif- very difficult question so let me try i'll try to give you two answers yeah. to this question yeah first of all you know we know from uh, well performed uh, longitudinal studies of identical twins as you said you know twins that are homozygous, they have exactly the same DNA. And we know from these studies that only 20 to 25% of their chance of living a short or long life is due to genes. 85% is due to environmental factors. Whoa. Okay? Yeah, that's a lot. We also know, we also know from another study on identical twins that Similarly, only 20 to 30 percent of the ch- of the chance of developing the most common cancer, like colon, breast, uh, um, prostate, and 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 many others, is due to inherited genes. The rest is due to environmental factors. Okay. Right. So this is a New England Journal of Medicine paper, 2000, published in 2000. As you know, New England Journal of Medicine is the top medical journal uh, in the world, uh, and uh, and so again, you know, there are more and more data showing that the genes in identical twins are responsible for not more than 30 percent of cancer and longevity. The rest is due, is due to environmental factors. And my lab, like many other labs in the world, they are trying to dissect what is this cocktail of environmental <laughs> yeah. factors yeah, yeah. that are predicting this lower risk of cancer and higher probability of living a longer life despite genes. Okay? Now, you are asking now a number. How many years? What I can tell you, and this is another study, is called the Framingham Heart Study. As you know, there is a small village in the U.S. called Framingham, where for many years, all the population, all the citizens of this, of, of this uh, small town has been enrolled in this study, in these longitudinal studies. And there was a paper published in circulation in 2006 where they measured cholesterol, blood pressure, BMI, glucose, and, uh, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in all these people when they were 50 years old, what they found is that people that had optimal cardiometabolic risk factors, if I remember well, total cholesterol was less than 180 milligram deciliter, they have no type 2 diabetes. Uh, the blood pressure was lower than 120 over 80 without treatment, you know. And uh, there was not, no smokers. Uh, the risk of these people of having a myocardial infarction in the remaining part of their life was 5%. Oh, yeah. In people with one abnormal cardiometabolic risk factor, the risk was 50%. And what does that mean? What, 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 does that, what does that mean, one, cardi, uh, what you just said there, if they have one? That they have high cholesterol, high right, blood pressure, right. or, or one diabetes, of those. or they were smoking, only one of those altered, abnormal, was 50% risk of having a myocardial infarction. And people with two or more abnormal cardiometabolic risk factors, it was 70%. So you go from 5%, basically meaning only five out of 100 are going to develop myocardial infarction to 70%, meaning seven out of 10, they're going to be, have a myocardial infarction. But most importantly, going back to your, to your question, the difference in lifespan was 11 years. 11 years. So now we are taking people who are 50 years old, not young, 50 years old, and basically the difference between people with optimal cardiometabolic risk factor and those with two abnormal is 11 years shorter. So if you apply this one to a healthy lifestyle started 
when you were much younger, I, I guess that probably instead of being 11, it will be 20, 25 years difference. That means instead of living, you know, 80 years, would be living 100. That is, that is fascinating. And one thing that is also probably very, or one thing that is also very important is that these people who died prematurely, who died 11 years earlier in this study, probably also had, uh, I mean, their health was probably not as good as well, right? That, I mean, that is also a very important point there. Oh, of course. And, you know, the, the problem is that, you know, how many people in this cohort of uh, Americans had optimal cardiometabolic risk factor? <laughs> no, <laughs> not many, I guess. 4% of males and or, or females, I don't remember, and two four, and two point five percent or females or males. So, but then, anyway, between four and two point between four and two point five percent, basically ninety six percent of people that had at least one abnormal cardiometabolic risk factor, and that's why because of the typical Western lifestyle and unhealthy <clears throat> diet of people living in Western countries. Because based on my studies. Based on my studies on calorie restriction, we know that now we have not only the, the data on the cross-section, cross-sectional data on people that, that have been doing calorie restriction for many years, but we just published a paper in uh, Lancet uh, and, uh, Metabolism Endocrinology uh, showing that, you know, in a randomized clinical trial that, you know, with a m- mild 13% calorie restriction, we were able to improve all the cardiometabolic risk factors. So we were, we were able to reduce cholesterol, increase HDL cholesterol, lowering triglyceride, lowering systolic and diastolic blood pressure, improving insulin sensitivity, lower C-reactive protein, that is a marker of inflammation. We also show a significant reduction in F2 isoprostol is a marker of oxidative stress. So basically, in these people, with just two years of moderate 13% reduction in caloric intake with, of course, you know, a healthy diet, we were able to improve all the cardiometabolic risk factor at a super physiological level, meaning similar to the people in the uh, framing a heart study that had optimal cardiometa- ca- cardiometabolic factors. So, so you mean that in the study with the 13% reduction in calorie intake, they almost resembled the people who was in this other study who had optimal like yeah. metabolic... Really? Yeah, exactly. With, with 13%? No, no, they, 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 no it, it, was, it was even better. The only trick of this study, you know, that, you know, this, in this study that I was mentioning, we recruited people that were 20 to 50 years old. Yeah. And they had a BMI of 22 to 28. So they were kind of healthy for the for the American range because as you know right now uh, 70% or more of US people, American people, they have a BMI higher than 25. For sure. Okay, so they are either overweight or obese. So the people that we were studying, they were young and relatively healthy. Despite that, despite being non-obese and he- relatively healthy, we were able to achieve with only 13% calorie restriction a super physiological improvement resembling the cardiometabolic risk of those 4% of citizen in Framingham that they had the optimal cardiometabolic factor. And, and in this study, you didn't change the diet, so they ate the same thing. The only thing you changed was that they ate 13% less calories. No, 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 no. To achieve, to achieve the, 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 you know, to have someone to be able, you know, to do uh, sustained calorie restriction for two years, you have to change the quality. Okay, 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 right. Yeah. It, may, may... There was also a change in quality, but it was not, strict you know people could choose you know you know our dietitian helped them out to find uh, a range of healthy food that were in some way 
that they, they, they liked. You know, right. so it was not, you know, we didn't enforce a certain percentage of protein or carb. You know, they were free to choose in, with different, you know, food uh, that were helping them, you know, to achieve, you know, this uh, 13% reduction in, in, in caloric intake. Interesting. So, so what, it would be interesting to just know what they did then. So, 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 so they, they changed, they had, you had a di- dietitian who met them, so they were able to get better information about their food and so they changed probably changed their their food habits and then they also maybe perhaps due to the change also of diet they and and perhaps also because of your initiative they also ate a bit less so 13 percent less i mean and 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 that made them and that created all these great results or yeah yeah in some way yes again you know you're right you know that's that's why we keep doing studies. That's why I keep doing studies, you know, because first of all, you know, a lot of people working in the aging field, they are working on yeast, worms, flies, yeah. and mice. Yeah. And they work on these animal models for several reasons. The most important one that, you know, the lifespan of a mice is two and a half years. So if you want to do a longevity study, it's very easy. You know, because well, easy. It's easier because in humans <laughs> yeah, it's lot, impossible. You, you can't you can't wait hundred years if you. Yeah, <laughs> and if you yeah. work on flies, you know, you can do in Drosophila. You can do an experiment. You know, in a, in a few months, in two three months, you know, you can do a longevity experiment. Yeah. So these are very powerful tools to uh, generate data to prove that you know, aging can be manipulated and the disease of aging can be manipulated and also to find out which genes are probably important. Right. But you cannot use this data and translate them directly into humans. And that's one of the major problems I have with some of these scientists that, you know, they observe that, for example, you know, fasting, alternate day fasting is increasing lifespan in mice. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, for example, just to give an example, one day of fasting, after two days of fasting, most of mice, they die. Okay? So if Mm. you fast a a typical mice for 48 hours, it dies. Mm. You and me who are, I can see, you know, we are both lean, we can easily go for a month without dying yeah without eating and without dying okay so there is fundamental difference between humans and mice and so that means that you know when you do alternate day fasting in mice one day you eat one day you don't eat probably is like seven days of continuous fasting right. in humans yeah. and seven yeah. days of continuing feeding it's a good point. So, you know, you are studying a completely different story. Now, with this time restricted feeding, there are a lot of people now, you know, testing time restricted feeding. 20 hours of fasting in mice is not 12, 12, 12 hours of fasting in humans. Probably it's more like three days of fasting in humans. Mm. Okay? So, again, you know, I, don't get me wrong. I think, you know, the signs, you know, that, you know, many of my uh basic science scientist colleagues have done they are fantastic and they are fundamental you know to to discover how we can which pathways which cellular functions are important for for longevity without people like Cynthia Canyon and uh, and and uh, and many others, you know, uh, we 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 couldn't have uh, even hope, you know, to get you know this this uh, depth of understanding of how beautiful and how fantastic is this regulation of pathways and how these uh, nutrient sensing pathways, you know, the the capability of our cells to sense how much energy and amino acids, proteins are required, you know, to manipulate these nutrient sensing pathways and therefore 
changing aging and disease of aging. Right. But going from there to apply this to humans, we have to be very, very careful. For sure. Because I, I hear and I read a lot of very dangerous applications of these findings in, in model organisms into humans from, from people that don't understand the difference between humans and animals. I think that's a very, I think that is a very good point. I think that perhaps also we should just rewind a little bit and also um, talk a little bit about what ca calorie restriction is for somebody who have never heard about it before. We've been talking about it already um, quite a lot. So like, what, what would you say, what is calorie restriction in a nutshell? Well, in animals, it's uh, it's very simple basically what we did what what people do in animals let's say you know we, normally what we do we we we, we measure what uh, animal eats you know typically a mice eats on average five grams of food per day and and then basically if you want to do a 30 percent calorie restriction you reduce by 30 percent the five grams so you give the animals 3.5 grams of food to eat and that's a 30 percent calorie restriction and we know that you know in animal studies if you reduce caloric intake you know from again ad libitum as much as the animals want to i don't know 40 percent the max you know that you know you can restrict in mice is 50 percent forget in humans it's not possible 50 percent is pure starvation but let's say in, in mice you can go up to 50 percent the animals are living 50% longer or more, okay? Now, the old dogma was that the more calorie restriction, the better. Recently, there are data showing that that's not true for all the species of mice. Mm. So, you know, if you take different strains of mice, there are some mice that, you know, on 40% uh, calorie restriction, they live longer, but other strains of mice on 40% calorie restriction, they live shorter. Then, you know, there are data from Rafa de Cabo showing that, you know, if you take these mice, then on 40% calorie restriction, they live shorter, and you put them on 20% calorie restriction, now they live much longer, suggesting that 40% for those strains of mice was excessive. It was pure starvation, okay? So that's another problem now that we have with, 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 with calorie restriction is that we don't, we don't have a biomarker that is telling us if we are overdoing calorie restriction. And you have been mentioning, I mean, we have been talking about before all the health benefits of doing calorie restriction. You talked about two different studies that it really seems to have a, quite a significant effect on health markers within humans. Um, and you also now mentioned that that can be that not more see not more calorie restriction is necessarily better so like if you would look at the human for example what would like be a what what would be an an up to optimal long term amount of calories that a man or a woman should eat to get like the maximum benefits of calorie restri restriction we don't know <laughs> we don't know, okay. but you know, as 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 I as I wrote in my book, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote, I just published a book where you know I I summarize, you know, twenty five years of research and uh, medical practice, and uh, the answer to your question is that you don't have to do calorie restriction by itself. You know, what we have been discovered, you know, when I started to work on calorie restriction 17, 20 years ago, the dogma was, there were two dogmas. One dogma, the more calorie, the better. As I told you, that's not true. Yeah. The other dogma was that the macronutrient composition of the diet was unimportant. We know that's not true now. And so the beauty and I think that's where we have to go from, from here is that, you know, by understanding which pathways they are promoting longevity and they are preventing diseases, you know, we can use different interventions 
that are acting on these different pathways. Because before I mentioned, you know, one of the most studied and important is the insulin IGF-1 mTOR pathway. But, you know, by, uh, by analyzing data from other uh, studies on longevity of rodents longevity, we know that, you know, inflammation is very important. We know that catecholamine you know, there are the AC5 knockout mice. AC5 is an important pathway for the uh, catecholamine pathway. And so if you knock out the AC5, the animals are living longer. There are uh, the, the um, angiotensin receptor 2 knockout mice that are living longer. And angiotensin 2 is very important for, long, for, for hypertension and longevity. And, and, and many other ones, you know, that, you know, that, you know, the, that, you know, we, we now know from studies in animals that are important pathways for longevity and, and health. And so my new approach that I describe in the book is that, you know, different interventions, they're acting on, on, on different pathways in, in a different way. And, and so instead of being instead of concentrating on one single intervention that can be calorie restriction, can be fasting, can be exercise, you know, by understanding which pathways, you know, are important, then, you know, we can use a cocktail of intervention that are acting concomitantly on different pathways so that, you know, we have, you know, the better outcome. Because, you know, one of my points, you know, that I write in the book, you know, that, you know, unfortunately, I don't know why, you know, People they like the magic ballot. You know, <laughs> yeah. give me one intervention. Just give, give me, me a, just give me a pill. And that <laughs> okay? Give me a pill or give me one intervention. Yeah. The five two diet, the paleo diet, the the, the vegan diet, uh, the the meditation, the interval training. And so in my career, I've been studying people who were convinced that, you know, exercise was the, the gold standard to improve longevity. And so these people, they were eating junk, but mm. they were maybe running 70, 80 kilometers per, per week. They were very lean, but, you know, you know, when we were putting them on a treadmill to measure the VO2 max, their fitness, it was scary, you know, all sorts of arrhythmias. And now we, and now we know from many studies that, you know, they're you know, if you are overdoing exercise, not only you are you, you are destroying your joints, but you know you have diffuse myocardial fibrosis, and if these myocardial fibrosis, you know these small uh, scars, they are hitting your heart conductive system, where you know not the muscle, but you know where the, the, the signal, the electrical signal is passing through, you are increasing your risk of fatal arrhythmias, right. fatal arrhythmias, and then so on. You know I can make lots of example of you know extreme diets or extreme interventions that are not really addressing the point the right. point is how can we act on multiple aging pathways without extreme interventions so that you know our life become pleasant not not like a like a, a starvation or sacrifice and optimize our health. And again, another important point, not only our physical health, you know, because I've been studying people that were obsessed with their physical health, but in terms of emotional health, in, in, in intuitive, creative health, they were very, very poor. And so again, you know, Another point I have right now is that, you know, I see a lot of people, again, you know, as I said, you know, they're obsessed, you know, with uh, living longer and other people, they're obsessed, you know, with losing weight or gaining, gaining muscle, muscle mass. But I'm asking for what? What's the meaning of life? Yeah. And so what the body is, is for, to me, is just an instrument to achieve freedom, to achieve happiness, to achieve a meaning of life and so unless we understand this principle i think you know living 10 years longer where you know you count every single calories and you become obsessed from what you eat or you become obsessed 
from exercise, I think is not healthy. And and I totally agree with you. The obsession is, I don't think it's a, or it's it's not a good thing. And you also you mentioned like the, that there are a little a lot of different strategies which work on different pathways. Um, still, like if if I would still go back to the calorie restriction, just so because you're 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 one of the people who really knows a lot of, about this when it comes to humans. So it, I think it would be really interesting to know your point of view. If you, if you would use calorie restriction in a good way. Like how, how, if you would like to get like the most of the benefit from calorie res- restriction alone uh, and just like when it comes to the amount of calories, like how, what, what would you suggest? What, what, what range would you suggest, for example, that you would reduce your calorie intake to? Again, there is not a number. You know, what, what I can tell you is that a good way to measure if you are in a healthy metabolic state, the easy one is to measure your waist circumference. Your what? Your... So if waist circumference, waist, okay. What, okay. the waist. Okay, how do you do that? Or what, what is it supposed to? You, you just take a meter and you measure your circumference around your belly, okay? Okay. If you go on, on, the, on the street, you can see, you know, that especially men, but now also women, as they get older, they, 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 they have an increase in waist circumference. Right. You know, they have to, to you know, the, their, the, the, the size of their pants is going gonna, is gonna to increase. So from when they were 18 years old and they were basically uh, practicing sport at their college, and when they are 40 years old, probably they've gained many people they've gained you know three or four sizes of you know of of their skirt or 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 or, or, or trousers okay and that means that they have they were in a, in a an excessive energy balance so they were consuming more calories than they were expanding so definitely they were not on calorie restriction they were in, in the opposite so one simple trick that I tell to everybody, if you want to improve your health, check your waist circumference. Mm. If you lose one centimeter in waist circumference, it means that you are in a neg- negative energy balance. If you are increasing your waist circumference, it means that you know you are in a positive energy balance. And what we know is that unlike you know, body weight can be tricky because, you know, you, if I start to exercise a lot, especially with uh, weight lifting, I may increase my body weight just because I increase my muscle mass. Yeah. But if you exercise a lot or, you, you know, uh, you are not going to increase your waist circumference because really waist circumference is a biomarker of abdominal fat. Right. So the more you, 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 if your waist circumference increases, it means that, you know, you are accumulating fat in your abdomen, especially visceral fat. And that's bad, you know, because we know that, you know, this visceral fat is producing a number of hormones that are technically called adipo- adipokines. And these adipokines like leptin, adiponectin, and many other ones that, you know, we have been studying are very important for the development of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, many type of cancer, probably dementia, and aging itself. You know, we know that, you know, when you have an increased waist circumference, for, for example, you are producing pro-inflammatory cytokines. You know, we publish a, a, a citation classic paper in diabetes uh, where we show, you know, basically that visceral fat is a major producer of interleu- interleukin-6 in humans, and this interleukin-6 produced by visceral fat is increasing C-reactive protein. That is a, a, one of the gold standard to measure inflammation. Right. So there is no doubt, you know, that as you gain waist circumference, as you gain abdominal fat, you, you increase inflammation, and inflammation is one of these key factors promoting aging and promoting multiple chronic diseases. So that's number one. So if you want to see, you know, if you are doing calorie restriction, 
measure your basic conference. A more sophisticated one is to measure your insulin, your fasting insulin. So if your fasting insulin is, is, is low and the lower the better, it means that you know you are very insulin sensitive and you are very insulin sensitive because you have lower visceral fat. All right. Okay. So those are the so those are the two the, the two the, the two best ways. Simple to one. Yeah. Yeah. Simple one. You know to measure. But then there are it's a bit more complex. Again, you know, my book is four run four hundred pages with sixteen hundred citations. So every <laughs> yeah. sentence, every every sentence has one or more references. Yeah. So people they can go and check. If what I'm saying is supported, you know, I, you know, my, my publisher said, you know, no, no, are you crazy? You know, 1600 references is going to be basically so many pages. So look, I'm not going to publish a book. I'm, I'm fed up of reading books where people, they're making statements exactly. that's without great. any yeah. support. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's a really, really good point. I, I wish more publisher were, would listen to people like you when they say that. Because, I mean, if, if you're reading a book, and I want to be able to know if what you're saying actually is actually true, and, and that it, even, even if you have a reference, even then it's hard, because, you have, of course, you have to take in yeah. enti- entire yeah. literature to account. So still you can, but it's, exactly. it's, a better, exactly. but it's, but it's know, still a better way. So. But, um, yeah, I mean, even you know, the, the the selection of the references is my selection. Exactly, and that's so. the problem. You know, the problem is that you know, I see a lot of people who are writing book based on their own selection of the literature. Yeah, and I, I, I you know, I, I I understand. You know, you know, you say, okay, but you also do that. Yes, that's true. But, you know, I've been working in this field for the last 35 years. I've been doing experiments in humans, uh, not in animals, in humans. Uh, and uh, I'm a doctor. I'm not a PhD. So I've been practicing stuff, you know, you know what I'm saying. And so I think, you know, you know, that that's one of my concerns that, you know, out there, there is a lot of confusion and people, they are very confused, you know, who, who, who I am believing, you yeah, know, it's, exactly. uh, you know, who, who, who is, it's, it's very confusing. And I understand that, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, it's very difficult. And again, it is very difficult even for me, you know, because, uh, even if I've been working as a, as a clinical scientist for many years in this field, can I tell you that, you know, I'm 100% confident of everything I have written in my book? No. No. I'm still learning. Exactly. But, you know, compared to what we knew 50 years ago and what we know now and the translation of some of the basic science into human experiments, it's making me more confident. Exactly. And I mean, in, and also people who are saying that they're not sure are also probably more trustworthy as well. Um, but I, I would also, I would like to <laughs> to get back to the previous question, Yang, just so I understand and just so that people can ten, can understand about this particular strategy. Just so, so, so what you're saying basically is that you're, you're measuring your waste. That is a good, good, good way. Um, and then basically then, it is basically not to be overweight then. I mean, to to have a waistline that is quite slim then, or or what, yeah, what, like, that's, what is that's, a good... Go ahead. You know, ideally, ideally, you shouldn't be able to pinch fat, okay? Ideally, right. ideally you shouldn't be able, when, when you touch your belly, you shouldn't be able and, to... And when you're standing up then as well, or, or it's just sitting down, because that's different yeah. again. If standing up, you, you shouldn't be able to pinch fat. You shouldn't be able, right. standing up or sitting down, okay? Okay, okay. yeah. That's the, that's the ideal. You shouldn't, you, sh- you know, that's the ideal. Then, as I said, don't despair, you know, if you have, if you can pinch fat, you know, try to work to reduce this fat. Every centimeter you are losing, you are improving your health. Every centimeter that is increasing, you are worsening your health, okay? So there is no doubt about it. The science in this field is clear. 
there is no doubt. If you, you can ask, you know, to 100 doctors, to everybody, they're going to tell you that, you know, visceral fat, abdominal fat is bad for you. Mm. Okay. Of but course, it, but it, you but need it, but, some visceral fat. But it's, uh, but it's also a good marker then of everything that you have been talking about earlier, the, the visceral fat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But then let's make a new step. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> let's say, you know, that, you know, you are a, 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 a marathon runner. So you are, you are, you have a very low waist circumference. You have no fat in your abdomen because you are running 100 miles per week because basically you are, uh, you, you are training for a marathon, but you eat junk. You eat, you know, a, you know, refined processed food, you are smoking, uh, whatever. Are you going to live longer? No, of course. You know, if you are malnourished, you know, let's say you have a diet that, you know, you are calorie restricted, but, you know, you are vitamin deficient. You have B12 deficiency, vitamin C deficiency, whatever. Yeah. You're going to die of malnutrition in a few years. So, again, the having a low waist circumference and you can achieve a low waist circumference in several ways. Yeah, for sure. It's a mix of exercise. You know, you can use exercise and diet, both. You have to use both. And that's a way, you know, to, to balance your energy, your energy, to find the balance of your energy balance is, you know, so that you know you you don't have an excess accumulation of 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 abdominal fat. Then for exercise, there are different ways to achieve that. You know, there is endurance, there is resistance, there is interval training. You know, and there are different mechanisms through which you know exercise. In the book, I explain. You know, I, I was lucky to work with uh, John Holozy. John Holozy just died a couple of years ago. He was my mentor and then my colleague and friend. He won, he won the gold medal at the Sydney Olympic Games and half a million dollar prize for his discoveries on how exercise is improving health. Yeah. So he discovered, you know, exercise is increasing mitochondrial biogenesis. He discovered that exercise is increasing GLUT4 and is improving insulin sensitivity. So... But the problem is that, as I said, you know, that, you know, if you are lean because you are exercising, but you are eating a low fiber diet, uh, you are eating uh, lots of animal products and a lot of amino acids like the branch and amino acids and the sulfur amino acids that are uh, stimulating the mTOR pathway, you're going to drive aging, even if you are lean. For sure. And, okay yeah so that's the complexity of the puzzle that's what i'm saying you know aging is a is a is a is a beautiful jigsaw puzzle where different components have to be in the right proportion to achieve an optimal result right. so going back to your question how long can you live well it depends <laughs> also on your genes you know because yeah, if you yeah. have if your parents you know, they have very bad genes and they, they, they both died when they were in their 60, 65. If you do everything wrong, probably you're going to die when you are 50. If you do everything right, probably you're going to die when you're going to be 80. Mm -hmm. If your parents, they have good genes and they were, despite eating, having a normal lifestyle, typical Western lifestyle, they were, they died when they were 85. If you do everything wrong, if you smoke, you overdrink and everything, probably you're going to die when you are 60. If you are doing everything right, probably you are one of these guys that can reach 115, 120. Right. I get it. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the last, last question again about the thing that I've, that I've been questioning before. So, so what you're saying basically is that the... That the ideal is to have no no body fat uh, around your belly at all. But like it, what I also um, can imagine is that I mean having a kind of uh, 
so to speak, normal waistline, already then you, sh- you should probably get a lot of the benefits. I mean, and if you're having like zero bu- uh, uh, fat around your, your belly, then you're perhaps getting 100%. But but if you're, uh, do you, are you understanding what I'm saying? That like, it's if, if you're already like being like hell. 80% healthy then you're probably getting or 50 per 60% healthy then you're probably already getting a, quite a lot of the benefit no what i'm saying is that you know based on what we know having a low waist circumference is a essential factor but it's not the only factor so if you have to start to you know if you have to start from something the first rule is try to lower your waist circumference. Then the question is how you lower your waist circumference with exercise, different type of exercise and diet. And then, you know, now the the complexity starts to say what type of diet, which is the best composition of diet. So let's say, you know, you know, you want to achieve that uh, reduction in caloric intake that is going to help you to uh, keep your your waist circumference low, what is the composition of that of those calories yeah. that are going to provide you with 100% of the RDI of the recommended daily intake for all the vitamins, so that you are not going to be deficient of any of these important vitamins, and on the same time, which is the right composition of macronutrients, you know, because right now, for example, there is this fed of high protein or now the ketogenic diet, high fat diet. Yeah. So based on animal studies, you know, we know that a high protein diet is accelerating longevity, uh, aging and is in increasing cancer. Okay? So being on a on a high protein diet, even if you are isocaloric, so basically you are lean this is not optimal. Yeah, I understand. So you need the optimal intake of protein and the optimal quality of protein. And then, you know, then you start to have people who start to tell you, ah, yes, but if you eat a lower protein intake, then you have to eat carbs and carbs are bad. Again, you know, this is a oversimplification because that's not true it depends what 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 type of carbs you know because most of the carbs in western society are refined flours white bread white pasta white rice a lot of sugary refined um, type of carbs you know but the healthy carbs the one you know the okinawans the centenarians of okinawas were eating or the centenarians of south italy were eating, they were complex carbs with a lot of fibers and phytochemicals and vitamins. Yeah, yeah. And then you go into which type of fat. You know, there are different types of fat that have different physiological response in terms of cardiovascular. So, for example, the animal fat, the saturated fatty acids, you know, they are, you know, there are lots of data showing that, you know, basically they are important, they are the, the, one of the main factors for the increase in cholesterol. That is one of the main risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Instead of the monosaturated fatty acids, you know, they are much healthier in terms of cardiovascular health and cholesterol. But again, the trick is that let's say you know extra virgin of olive oil is very healthy in terms of type of fat because they are mainly monounsaturated fatty acids. But the problem is that you know one tablespoon of olive oil is 120 calories. So if I eat 10 tablespoons of olive oil per day, that's 1,200 calories. Yeah. And therefore, if I'm not exercising, I'm going to become obese because <laughs> I'm going to accumulate fat in the abdomen. Yeah. So as you can see, it's is, a puzzle. Is, is, yeah. a, is, a, is, is, is a puzzle where, you know, you have, to, you have to understand the players. It's like, you know, if you are a, a musician. If exactly. you are a conductor, yeah, it's a great metaphor. Have, yeah, you know, if you are a conductor and you have the score of the, I don't know the the symphony number no. four of Mahler, one of my favorite one, and you have to play it, even if you have the best players, you have to decide how they have to play, yeah. how they have to yeah. pose, you know, yeah. to have the best result. Okay, so it's the same in life, you know. What we are trying to do is to understand 
who is the violin, who is the viola, who is the bass, who is the drummer, and to fine tune their activity so that, you know, we get the perfect symphony. For sure. And I mean, so, I mean, your, your point is really important that there are different strategies that we need to use. There are different players in the orchestra to be able to play the, the sound, per, the, the song perfectly. Um, what I would, would like to a- ask you also, I mean, you have been really into like a lot of different strategies. If you would give advice to an every, every, everyday person, if they would like to be able to live longer and live healthier for longer of all the different strategies like how, what advice do you have to give to the the everyday person of what they should do again now you're asking me a 1 million question it's like if you ask me if you ask you know a, a conductor can you give me an advice on you know which is the best way to conduct a symphony, uh, an orchestra, or, or if you are asking to a, a, a kung fu master, can you give me a few tricks on how I can become a black, a black, black, black belt of karate? It's difficult. Yeah. Uh, again, as I said, you know, is a mix, is 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 a number of of. Uh, of interventions that they have to be played in the right way to to do that you have to understand the mechanisms of how each intervention uh, acts and then you have to apply this intervention on yourself and experiment because you know, understanding doesn't mean that you know that you you're gonna be able to practice. It's like you know, again, you know, I can read a book of yoga or I can go to a couple of lessons of yoga, but you know, to be able you know to to perform that asana well, it takes time. Uh, and so, just to summarize, what I said is that. Rule number one, we should try to stay lean. And lean means having a flat abdomen while maintaining a good muscle mass. Okay? To do that, you have to do different type of exercises and you have to eat well. And you have to eat basically a diet that is lower in calories, but enough to, you know, to keep your muscle mass. And you have to select foods that is has the right amount of calories, protein, with the, the right quality of protein, so that it's lower in brain chain and sulfur amino acids that are driving the mTOR pathway and driving insulin resistance and, and diabetes and cancer. You have to have the right amount of fat and carbs and phytochemicals from fibers, because what we know that you know fibers, different type of fibers and phytochemicals through the gut microbiota are producing metabolites that are very important for immune health and uh, and mental health and and then you know there are a number of other practices you know where you know stress you know we know that act is acting through the catecholamine cortisol pathway and can impinge into immune and inflammation and other metabolic pathways that are key for aging. And then there are, for example, some breathing techniques that are also impacting on the catecholaminergic parasympathetic system that is also regulating inflammation and other pathways that are important for aging. So again, you know, it's, 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 it's a beautiful puzzle. And so, you know, probably we need not an hour, but we need several hours, you know, to, to, to go through, through, you know, each one. So what I can tell you right now, I tried, you know, to summarize, you know, this knowledge that I was telling you in this book, uh, you know, uh, as, as I said, you know, this is my interpretation is my symphony. You know, you know, I'm now a co- one of the conductors who is trying to interpret the 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 Mahler or Shostakovich symphony 
based on my experience as a human being, as a doctor, as a scientist that has been working in 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 in, uh, in US, uh, you know, doing experiments, you know, in humans coming from the aging biology of aging field, and that's my interpretation of what what are the factors that can manipulate these metabolic and molecular pathways that based on animal data that we have so far are important for maximizing our probability of living a longer and healthier life. For sure. Unfortunately, what most people are doing right now in the Western societies is do is exactly the opposite of what they should do. And the result is an is an unprecedented epidemics of obesity, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and uh, and there are issues with that. One issue is that this sick care system, because that's what it is, you know, people they call healthcare. This is a sick care system. So basically, what we do, what we do in medical school, mostly is to train doctors to recognize disease that typically take between 20 and 50 years to develop. You don't develop a cancer or myocardial infarction because for one night or one month you eat unhealthy. It takes many, many years of unhealthy lifestyle to change these metabolic molecular pathways so that you know, the, the damage accumulates until you have one disease and if you live long enough, you develop multiple diseases. Instead of, I think, you know, we should use this knowledge to prevent the accumulation of damage so, you know, that we are reducing our risk of getting sick and we are increasing our pro probability of living a uh, long and healthy life. And, and unfortunately, you know, all the system is driven by money and is driven by uh, developing drugs. So, you know, I left U.S. for this very reason, because, you know, when you were writing a grant, Unless you were saying exactly this is the mechanism that I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, dissecting, that I'm looking for, you didn't get the money because, you know, they are interested in pharmacological targets. They want to find a new pharmacological target to treat that disease that is going to generate a lot of money. And I'm not interested in that whatsoever. And, and then there is another problem. The other problem is that people they don't realize, and I think they start to realize with this COVID and uh, and now with the bushfires season and stuff like that. You know, you're not, as I said in my book, that you know what we do is not only influencing our metabolic health, but is also influ influ deeply influencing environmental health. So let's say it's not true, but let's say you know that a high protein diet, a high animal protein diet, it's healthy for human beings. But if this lifestyle is destroying the environment, even if you are healthy, but you are living in a very polluted, you know, uh, environment, you're not going to live longer. And what we know is that this intensive animal farming, can you imagine if now 1.3 billion Chinese and 1.3 uh, whatever billion Indians and then many other people, they start to eat the amount of animal products that, you know, us in Western countries were consuming every single day, twice a day, what is going to be for the environment? I'll tell you, we already know deforestation in, in, in Amazonia, they are destroying, I don't know how many hectares of land every single month, you know, to free land, you know, to grow uh, cheap uh, meat, you know, for uh, uh, crops, you know, to feed animals, is uh, polluting the water because we have to use pesticides and herbicides to grow huge amount of crops, you know, soybeans and corn and other grains, you know, to feed billions of animals. And then, you know, is polluting, uh, is causing global warming. 25% of global warming is due to intensive animal farming. Is causing pollution because basically 25% of particular matter is due to intensive animal farming is drying up water and these intensive these these uh, these uh, 
pollution and the global warming is melting the glaciers and is, is causing bushfires, extreme weather condition. This uh, uh, is causing antibiotic resistance because many of these animals in this intensive animal farming, we have to give them antibiotics. And so we are developing antibiotic resistance uh, that is going to impact human, human health soon. It's not me, but the World Health Organization it says that, you know, we are running out of antibiotics because of this crazy use of antibiotics in inter intensive animal farming. <clears throat> and so if you look at the big picture, what we are doing with our lifestyle is not only impacting human health, but is impacting in an unprecedented way environmental health. So this COVID is coming out of this inten intensive animal farming. Many other viruses, maybe the COVID not directly, it looks like it's coming from this wet, you know, wet, uh, uh, wet type of uh, wild animals. But, you know, some others, you know, flu-like, uh, avarian, avarian flu viruses were coming out of this intensive animal farming. And we're going to get more and more and more. Can you see the disruption in terms of the economy of these of, of these epidemics? You know, we are losing trillions of dollars because of that. And so I think, you know, people, they have to start to understand that, you know, if we want to live in a healthier planet, in a more equitable world where, you know, resources are more equally distributed, and we are really interested not in making money, but in living a healthy, happy, uh, family-friendly oriented society. We need to change our way of looking at health in a more systemic way. For sure. And, and especially what you said there about how we are affecting the world right now, it's really, really unprecedented and something that would probably continue if we look at the way we're, we're treating everything right now. So, so that is a very, very good point. Yeah, no, um, but it's, it's, it's really crazy. You know, even think about it, you know, with, about these pharmacological targets. Let's say, you know, we are going to find the drug for each disease. I don't believe so. I may be wrong, but I don't believe, you know, we are going to find the drug is going to cure every single disease. In fact, you know, none of the drug we are using is, is curing disease. We are just treating. We are keeping disease under control. You know, if you have high blood pressure, you're going to take one or two medications for the rest of your life. If you have type 2 diabetes, you're going to take one, two or three or four medications for the rest of your life. But where are these drugs ending up? Yeah. So if you take a, a, a antidepressant or a antineoplastic drug, do you think these metabol the metabolites of these drugs they're going to disappear? No. People they are pee poo pooping and peeing these metabolites into the toilet. From the toilet goes into the rivers because you know our system to you know to they are not able to get rid of these uh, of these metabolites you know there are studies showing you know that you know you can find some of these metabolites into the fish and into into the and probably they go into the deep water and from the deep water they go back into the into the food we are eating so if millions of billions of people they are starting to take drugs and all these metabolites they end up in the food system in in the in you know can you understand what I'm, what, what I'm coming from? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So the system is sick. The system is totally sick. And what we know instead of that, you know, we have the knowledge right now to live in a fantastic world. Mm. If we could apply what we know already now that can be improved, no way, <laughs> big ways, you know, you know, we could already transform this world and making this world a much better world. 80% of cardiovascular disease, according to World Health Organization, are preventable. My data suggests that 95% of cardiovascular disease are preventable. And cardiovascular disease is the first cause of death and the most expensive, uh, is the bigger burden on financial, on, 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 the, on, the, fi on the financial balance of every state in, in, in Western countries. According to World Health Organization, at least 40% of common cancer are preventable. 
according to my data, probably 70 to 80 percent of common cancer are preventable. And this is the second cause of death in Western countries. And then you go, you know, probably of you, you take kidney disease, probably 60 percent of kidney disease are preventable because 30 to 40 percent are due to type 2 diabetes and another 30 percent are due to high blood pressure and coronary artery disease. And then you go in each b- branch of medicine and you're going to find that, you know, between 30 to 80, 90 percent of the disease that every single specialist is treating are in some way preventable. Yeah, and that is a, that is something that is really, really important to to get out there. I think that it it is these that that is that lifestyle is something that we know can affect all of these things, but it's something that I think a lot of people don't really understand exactly how powerful it actually can be for all this stuff. And and if 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 people would be interested to learn more about this stuff, then I would highly suggest your book called The Path to Longevity. I I know you also have a YouTube channel. Prof. Luigi Fontana. If you just um, if you just go to YouTube and search for Luigi Fontana, you will you will find your your YouTube channel there. Is there any other where or is there any other place where people can find what you do? Um, well, you know, I have a few socials where you know I post you know articles. You know, probably every couple of days. You know, I, I go through the literature. In Nature, Science, New England, JAMA, the top the top journals. Yeah. And if I see some interesting article, normally I post it in on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and Facebook. You know, so I have you know uh, these three socials where you know I try to 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 again you know every single day. Well, a few times a week, you know, I post you know I post yeah, you know yeah. things I think you know are, are very interesting and important coming out of science. So I think yes, that's that's the, the the that's it. You know, now University of Sydney, you know, oh, uh, I've been hired here. You know, because the idea is that you know we want to try to approach you know the complexity of uh, uh, the of lifestyle medicine and the impact of lifestyle medicine not only on human health on environmental health from a more holistic systemic approach and you know not only we are gonna we, we are developing new science new studies to try to fine-tune our understanding of how the human body works and how these different interventions they are acting on different pathways and different pathologies but you know for example one of our ideas is that you know we should also try to change for example the medical uh, degree, for example, now I've started to teach at medical students about this concept that, you know, we were discussing today. And, yeah. and so far, you know, they were very, very, very interested. You know, they were very happy that, you know, that, you know, we were explaining in a, me- in a mechanistic way, you know, how uh, different uh, lifestyle intervention can act on different metabolic and molecular pathways. I would like also to have not only theoretical, but also practical, because I think, you know, you know, as a physician, you, you, you should also know how to prescribe and practice stuff. You know, if you prescribe exercise, yeah. yourself should be able to practice and have an idea of what happens in your body when you do certain type of exercise and you should be able to cook healthy food. So, you know, when you're, patient comes to you and you're going to tell him, you know, what should I eat? You know, you have an idea of what you're eating. Instead of many doctors, well, all the doctors, I have no idea. Basically, you go through medical school, as I said, you know, where, you know, you learn everything about drugs and surgeries and diagnosis, but almost nothing about, you know, what to eat, how to exercise of, you know, how to be mindful, how to be a compassionate human being. And, and eventually we were like, you know, that every student on campus, you know, the future uh, politicians, the future lawyers, economists, journalists, professors, they're going to come out of university. So if these students, they, they know, they have a bas- basic understanding, theoretical and practical understanding of how what they do is influencing their health and the health of the environment, maybe 
we can transform, we can slowly transform this world in a better planet, in a better world. And eventually also we have to go in primary and secondary school. Because, for example, my kid in Australia, you know, they have 15 minutes to eat, only 15 minutes. Typically, in 15 minutes, they, they have, you know, a sandwich, very unhealthy sandwiches, typically. And then, you know, when it's 3.15 3 and they end school, you know, they, 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 they are so hungry that they, they rush into one of these uh, fast foods, luckily not my kid, and they, they, gird, they, 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 they eat, you know, as much as they can of junk food. And so that's what we are lear- teaching to our kids. That's, you know, the, 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 the type of education we are giving them. You know, that food is not important, that you can eat whatever you want. So you study math, gram, but you don't study basically the importance of what you eat on your, on your physical, emotional, because we know that, you know, what you eat and what you do, your, the exercise, for example, is very important for, for memory, by increasing BDNF and other factors, you know, other practices are very important to improve your emotional health, your intuitive intelligence, your creative intelligence, and we are not teaching anything about it to them. For sure. And and if somebody who's listening to this would like to learn more about this stuff, I mean, learn about more about how to affect their age or health or longevity, do you have any recommendations of other books or other web pages that a lay person could, could, uh, could use? Well, there are, there are several I mean, you know, for example, among the, the, the people, you know, of course, you know, after all many years of, 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 uh, of research, you know, I have, you know, the people that, you know, I trust the most. And for human, uh, for human uh, medicine, you know, for, I think, you know, for example, the Harvard group with uh, Walter Willett, Frank Hu, uh, Eric Rim, you know, there are a good source of uh, reliable signs. Uh, I, I follow them, you know, I, I collaborate with them, you know, we, we, they are epidemiologists, you know, they are not really doing the, this ki- type of mechanistic science. They are more looking at these uh, big epidemiological studies like the nursal study, the physical study, but they are providing very important data because, of course, you know, in humans, you know, you cannot do a 10 years randomized clinical trial. Yeah. So of course you you have to have you have to have a combination of epidemiological data with uh, uh, physiological translational clinical trials with animal studies and you have to put them together to make sense of the complexity and the beauty as I said of this of this uh, of this field that is so important for human environmental health. So, yeah, I think, you know, people, they should make their own, um, they should select uh, the good scientists and, uh, and follow them up and, um, and form their own uh, view of what is good science. And, uh, and first of all, they should, instead of, be very careful when people they tell them you know they have a magic ballot when they when when someone is telling is telling you i know everything yeah. and you know this is take this take this pill or do this one only this simple stuff and you're gonna be healthy and you're gonna live forever you know be careful for sure and before we we end up like what would be your take home your final take home message from from our conversation today Well, my final take home message is that people they un- underestimate how much power they have in their hands, how much control they have in their hands about their health. You know, people they think you know, you know, uh, health, uh, you know, good health or bad health is due to to bad genes or or bad luck. That's not true. You know, the data we have generated by all these studies in animal models, in humans, you know, putting together the best science, as I said, is telling us that probably 20 percent 
of our chance of developing a disease or living a short or long life is due to genes, and 80% is due to environmental factors. Of course, you know, luck is a component, but, you know, just to finish, you know, what I tell to my medical students is this one. Let's say, you know, that, you know, you are not changing your tire. And so basically you are driving your motorbike or your car with flat tires. If there is a, if it rains, you know, your chance of having an accident, you don't have to be a genius. It's much higher if you have flat tires than if you have new tires, okay, with a good grip. Right. And, and so luck, of course, you know, you, you can be unlucky and you can have an accident even with very good tires, but your chance of having an accident is much, much lower than if you have flat tires. Your chance of having an accident if you are speeding up to 200 miles per, per hour is much higher than if you, if, you, if, you, if you drive at 50 miles per hour. You have to be a genius to understand that. And the same is for health. Yes, luck has a component. There are few people that despite drinking, over drinking alcohol, smoking and eating unhealthy diets, they live to 100 years. But this is very, very small minority. The great majority of people, you know, if they are, if they are, if they are smoking, drinking, and eating unhealthy, they are gonna develop disease and they are gonna die much younger. Mm. And so when people they say, yeah, but you know, my grandfather died, you know, when he was 100, and he was smoking, drinking. Yes, it is, it, it exists, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a minority. It's like you know, if you say how many people they can, uh, they can compete in the Tour de France of Giro d'Italia. You and me, even if we train 20 hours a day we will never be able to even compete in the Tour de France, not win the Tour de France. So these are exceptional human beings, you know, that, you know, with special genes. And so this is, these are exceptional people. So luck and genes are a component of our life, but there, there, there is more component, probably 30% of that is due to genes and bad luck. The great majority is due to what we do. And we have, a, 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 a big control, a large control of on, on this, uh, on our life and on our health. And by knowing what we should do, like, you know, again, you know, if you, if you know that, you know, you have to change your oil, you have to change your tie, you have to change your brakes, you have to, you, you have to do certain things with your car, you know that you, you're going to drastically reduce your risk of, having an accident. For sure. And I think that is a very, very good take home message for everybody listening. Um, Luigi, I would like to say a big, big thank you for, for coming on and big, big thank you for the work you, that you are doing. And I mean, as I said, when we started, I really, really like your approach. You're very scientific in, in what you, what you do. And, and you also have this broad approach where you really try to look at all of these different things to be able to see what works and, and also to really, really try to help people. So, so big, big thank you for everything that you do. No, thank you. No, I mean, in some way, I'm an, I'm an egoist, you know, because, you know, I'm doing that, you know, because not only for me, but also for my, 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 kid, my kid and my grandkid, you know, I would like, you know, him to live in a more healthy and equitable, happy world than, you know, that, you know, and if we don't work together, you, me, you know, you, you are doing a fantastic job because, you know, without you, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have a chance to reach, you know, a few other people. Uh, that you know they are gonna and, and as we as we grow and as people they understand you know this concept you know I think you know we can have a movement where you know people they are gonna start to think to be more mindful and they're gonna they're gonna understand that they are not only impacting their own their own health but you know if they have kids like m many of us have kids and grandkids what we are doing right now is gonna 
shape the future world where our offspring is going to live. And, you know, and that's very important. And so that's why I think, you know, we have to work together to create a movement of people who, who are really doing the right things to promote human and environmental health. For sure. I couldn't agree with you more. Again, big, big thank you for, for coming on and sharing everything. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, okay bye. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the episode. Friends, I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there. So I was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos, so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Yeah.